we were to have two uh, people come and speak about their experiences today, but one of the people, uh, William Hovink, who was a resistance uh, fighter in, in uh, Holland, and who, as he says, spent three years as a guest of Adolf Hitler in uh, Dachau and Buchenwald, called me this morning and said he had a cold and he really couldn't come. So we've tried to put something together with you, but we are very pleased that <coughs> Lucille Eichenbring is here with us. Um, how many of you have the book with you? Well, she's got a broken wrist, but maybe she'll sign, she'll sign the book for you. So what we're going to do is, uh, first of all, to introduce Barbara Lesh McCaffrey, who Barbara Lesh McCaffrey, who is the past, shall we say, uh, co-coordinator of the series, and is currently the uh, president of the Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust at Sonoma State, the community organization that raises money for us and makes it possible for us to bring some of the world-class speakers um, that Steve Bittner referred to last week. Um, so Barbara has uh, a few words to say. Today's lecture is dedicated to a past member of the Alliance and a wonderful person in a community by the name of Walter Cutton. And I'll let Barbara take care of that. Thank you. It feels strange not to have been here for the last two weeks. And you'll probably see me most of the rest of the semester. We are very honored to dedicate today's lecture to Walter's memory. Before I say a few words about Walter, though, I wanted us to start with a very short video that was put together by another former faculty member who taught in this series, Ilka Hartman. It is a series of photographs of people who have been speakers in our series and members of our board and include some images of Walter and Sylvia and Evie, who've been active members of the Alliance, and we're grateful to have them here. Um, so I'd like us to start with the video, and then I'll tell you a little about Walter, and then I'll turn it back over to Myrna.
It almost feels like this room is filled with all the people who have spoken in this series and the number of survivors who've been part of this community. But one of those dearest to our hearts was Walter, who was for very many years a member of the Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust and also a member of the planning committee that put on the annual Yom HaShoah event uh, sponsored by the Jewish Community Center and the Jewish Community Agency that Daniel's been uh, affiliated with. Walter was first born in the Rhineland and then later moved to central Germany and from the time he was 11 lived with his uncle in a Berlin suburb, Wannsee. Some of you have already gotten the significance of that town from your readings. Uh, he remained in school in Germany until May of 1934 and um, from there moved with his family to what appeared to be the safety of Mallorca in Spain until the Spanish Civil War erupted and he ended up in Switzerland and then ended up in the United States and managed to get himself drafted into the army with his older brother. He lived an amazing life and um, one of the things that struck me more than anything else was Walter's gentleness, his concern for others, his enormous generosity. And uh, when we were writing his biography for the event that took place this past September, honoring our county Holocaust survivors, he said we should subtitle his biography, How Lucky Can You Be? And I think on behalf of the Alliance, our response was, no, it was we who were lucky. Thank you. Uh, rather than put the whole uh, program on Lucille's shoulders, although I'm sure she could carry it, if you notice, Lucille has been coming and meeting with students for quite a while and has given graciously of her time and her insights. We thought we might show you just a bit of a, an autobiographical video that Bernard often did. Uh, Bernard uh, was born in Krakow in Poland and um, eventually made his way through several uh, concentration camps as well as Auschwitz. Um, he was fortunate enough to survive and also to have his brother survive, but every other member of his family, he, he often says, I think there, there were 51 members of his family who did not survive. But when one of the things that, ways that I met Bernard, uh, I met Bernard in the late 80s when he was also a student at, the, at Sonoma State University. He had come back to the university and was studying film and video and one of the things that he did was uh, a project um, where he videotaped his life. And I believe this piece comes from uh, the beginning of one of his tapes, which he called My Hometown Concentration Camp. And so we're going to see a snippet of that. Um, OK. Kimberly, wait. Wait until it's up. Okay. Jacob and Gittel, of an immediate family of over 50 people, only my two brothers and I survived. 
I was liberated from Germany by the American army in May 1945. After the Holocaust, I lived in Italy for one year, in England for four and a half years, and then I came to the United States, where I was drafted and served in Korea. I married and had two sons. For six years, I stuffed my pains and tears down. I denied it even to myself as if it was all a dream. Encouraged by the survivors who have spoken out before me, I began to imagine I did not have to hide my experience in the Holocaust. The shofar, a ram's horn, the most ancient of instruments, is used as a call to assembly or as a warning in times of extreme danger. A prophet said, a horn shall be blown and they shall come that have been lost. I am sounding that horn now. Please listen. Familiar yet changed, 
was where I watched soccer games, played hooky from school, and in the winter rode a sled down the hill into this park, which was once a bustling marketplace. I accompanied my mother to the Rennec to purchase milk, butter, eggs, cheeses, fresh vegetables, and an occasional chicken. I liked the excitement of lots of people shoving and selling their goods and the special aromas of the market. I rarely looked up at this church when I walked by because I was afraid. Occasionally, young people would shout, there's a Jew, or let's get him, followed by stone throwing or a chase. I felt I was running for my life as I heard, dirty Jew, why don't you go to Palestine? The church steeple became a symbol of fear in my child's mind. When I first looked at Krakusa Street, the apartment building seemed smaller. I remembered the friends I played with and the windows of their homes. My parents had a tobacco concession. Cigarettes, tobacco, and newspapers were sold from this window. I spent many hours playing in this courtyard. The walk were completely glassed in to keep out the winter snow and rain. At the apartment of my friend, Hamed Goldstock, I remembered games of hide and seek and the inviting smell of noodle soup with beans. It was a great place for hide and seek. So many places to hide. Little did I know that this game would turn into a life-saving device. Once inside our old apartment, I remembered where the stove had been. Our source of light was a kerosene lamp, and we brought our water in from the courtyard. To the left of the window was a cabinet containing a bottle of schnapps. My father made kiddush here when he returned from shul. The hallway was a pantry for preserves, sacks of potatoes, and other staples. My uncle, Yusef Markovich, lived around the corner with his wife and two red-haired children. This building housed the mikvah, or ritual baths. I accompanied my father here on Friday nights. The streets were full of life and activity. There were friends and neighbors everywhere. I recognized our neighborhood synagogue entrance. On Fridays, I carried the shawl and cakes my mother prepared to the bakery near the shul. Crumbs of sweets from the bakery trays were my reward. On Chavnetskiego Street, the prison remains a prison. Chavnetskiego was our route to the Hader, the Talmud Torah. I remember going to the Hader for Yiddish lessons. When Hader was over, we had to run from Polish boys throwing stones or chasing us with sticks. After the Nazi invasion of Poland in 1939, our neighborhood in Krakow became a ghetto. Here stood barbed wire fences and armed guards. In the beginning, there were humiliations of people. This was called sport with the Jews. This is what I looked like in the ghetto though it is not a picture of me. I remember smuggling food to a starving family. I remember fear and being humiliated verbally and physically. I remember hunger, disease, and starvation. 
I remember searching for any scraps of food or fuel I could find in garbage dumps. I remember having to wear a yellow star as if I were an inferior human being. I remember being called a Jew and a Christ killer. I was spat upon and kicked without understanding why. In the ghetto, my mother was bitten by a German shepherd dog loosened by a guard. She was in a food line. My brother told me about this incident after 30 years of silence. This was the entrance to our second home in the ghetto. As the roundups continued, the ghetto boundaries became smaller. My father and I worked here repairing shoes with wooden nails. My older brothers, Nathan and Solomon, did not live here with us. They had been sent to a forced labor camp in the salt mines of Yelichka. Mother and my sister Miriam disappeared from this apartment while I was out of the ghetto smuggling food. Early deportations were deceptive. They were being held on the train. They did not know what awaited them at the end of the train ride. Forty years later, as I traveled by train to Poland, I wondered if the kettle cars I saw were the same ones used to transport my mother and sister to my Donek, the death camp near Lublin. I remember people being shot down by guards if they tried to escape. The guards were laughing and enjoying the sport as if they were out hunting animals. When the ghetto was liquidated, my father and I were marched to Plaszow, a concentration camp not far from the city of Krakow. In Plaszow, I worked with my father in a shoe factory. Every day, truckloads of people were driven by the factory. As they disappeared over the hill, I heard gunshots. I was only 12 years old. I was curious. So one day, after the shooting had ended, I went to the top of the hill and discovered corpses and firewood stacked up and burning. Horror, revulsion, and fear took over in me. On my return journey, when I stood in the place where I witnessed the pyres and the bodies burning, I felt the need to be alone. <coughs> While I was in Plasha, I was ordered to assemble with other children. We were loaded onto a horse-drawn wagon and I overheard that we would be executed in the Jewish cemetery. I jumped from the wagon, undetected by the guards. A Polish family sheltered me for the night at the risk of their lives. The next day, I found my Uncle Meyer and he hid me in Ulan. From my hiding place in the rafters of the barracks, I saw many people murdered.
When Yulag was liquidated, I marched back to Plashov with the other prisoners and was reunited with my father. Again, I witnessed from my place of work mass murders such as this one. I remember people being hung for trying to escape. Note the casters on the gallows. They were used again and again and again. The Einsatzgruppen's slaughtered hundreds of thousands in forests and fields. However, even these squads of psychopaths in uniform began to feel the strain of carrying out their work. They received additional liquor rations while their superiors devised more efficient techniques for genocide. So an Auschwitz was created where four million people were murdered. <laughs> Having seen my old neighborhood, the ghetto and the site of the Plaschow camp, I felt ready to return to Auschwitz-Birkenau. I was never in the main Auschwitz camp, but because of the proximity of Auschwitz I to Birkenau, the camp I was in, I had some vivid flashbacks. I remember a train journey, the thirst, the dying, and the dead surrounding me. I remember my father trying to protect me and his feeling of helplessness. After three days and nights in a cattle car, my father and I arrived at Auschwitz-Birkenau amidst noise and confusion. the selection process. An SS man decided the life or death of each new arrival by pointing casually to the left or right. The deceit worked to the last moment as people were unsuspectedly herded to what appeared to be showers, but in fact were gassing chambers. After the selection, I saw my father moving away in the opposite direction. We looked at each other from a distance, and I sensed that we would not see each other again. I was tattooed and sent to a quarantine block where the barrack leader chose me for sexual assault. Inside the camp, I heard rumors and breathed the smoke. I did not want to believe it. I thought, the outside world does not know of the horrors going on, and surely God will save us. Besides, things can get worse. The Germans, with their literature arts, are the most civilized people on earth. Barracks and electrified fences, dogs and guards inside. Machine guns in the towers. I saw many people try to escape and be shot down. Or was it suicide? The latrine, 
If I could make it there, I was still alive. News of other barracks and camp events were quickly exchanged in the moments of relative peace. For the Kafos and the guards did not like to go in there. Bunks. The crowding and stench of human bodies was oppressive. But that was a way of sharing body warmth in winter. Many people died during the long nights. If we were lucky, we had a blanket. Technological efficiency, guard towers, barbed wire, gas chambers, crematoriums, a system that was developed to dispose of millions of people and eliminate the evidence. The Nazis took precautions to keep the mass slaughter a secret. The gas chamber and crematorium crews called the Sonda Commando, were regularly slaughtered and replaced. Auschwitz-Birkenau had seven gas chambers. Just one of them had the capacity to gas 3,000 people at once, and the Nazis did this many, many times, often around the clock. Prominent guests from Berlin were present at the inauguration of one of these large gas chambers. SS guards dropped the deadly Zyklon B pellets into the gas chamber from the roof vents. The program consisted of the gassing and burning of 8,000 Krakow Jews. The guests, both officers and civilians, were extremely pleased with the results. A special peephole fitted into the door of the gas chamber was in constant use. They were lavish in their praise of the newly erected installation. My father and I were Krakow Jews. We arrived on one of these trains and were separated there. Did they watch my father die? As I walked through the Auschwitz Museum grounds, I felt an impulse to reach out and grasp the rusted wires. <coughs> Yet, after 36 years, I hesitated. The museum director, Kazimierz Smolin, and historian Teresa Teglowska were extremely <coughs> willing to help. Teresa spoke English and made us feel welcome, seeing as well that we became the official guests of the museum. Ironically, the room we stayed in was Commandant Hess's office. Hess was the Commandant of all of Auschwitz, including the factories and extermination centers. Here, Hess and his staff process the orders for transports, executions, exterminations, and the Auschwitz factory orders for the Nazi war machine. His wife, 
and five children live in comfort, isolated from the horrors of the camp less than one block away. Work makes you free, has wrote before his execution in 1947. Work in prison is a means of training for those prisoners who are fundamentally unstable and who need to learn the meaning of endurance and perseverance. Thank you, Courtney. Um, I wanted to make sure that we had enough time for Lucille. Um, I'm sure that you uh, get a sense of uh, how deeply um, wounded Bernard was by what happened to him. We would imagine that anybody who would experience that would feel that deeply. Um, but once again, I, I would like to tell you, as I've told you before, everybody who survived that event um, survived it in different ways and assembled and made sense of their experience in different ways. And I assure you that even though Lucille is going to tell you her story with, um, in great detail and with great passion, that she will also tell you how she experienced this um, event. And we're most pleased and honored to have Lucille Eichen Green with us, so I ask you to welcome her. I returned last week from a short visit to Germany. A few facts struck me. The amount of memorial sites in the city like Berlin are overwhelming. You see them in bus stops, you see them on the streets, you see them all over. There are plaques at every corner. My question is, we have money for the plaques. We have money for the memorials. Why isn't there any money for those people who survived and don't have enough bread to eat? I got no, quest no answer to my questions. The German population, by and large, seems to ignore these memorial. In a way, the older ones wish they would disappear. People of your generation have trouble coming to terms, being confronted at every corner with the memory of the past. Be that a half-destroyed church, a synagogue which is being rebuilt, the Liebeskind Museum, and the new memorial in Berlin consisting of a variety of 20,000 stones of different sizes. The stones evoke no feeling. They are neither a cemetery nor are they a memorial. The museum underneath these stones has some meaning. The stones in themselves are for the Germans. They don't know what to do with them and certainly a Jew coming there doesn't know what to do with them. The young group of Germans Wanting reconciliation is very much to be admired, but reconciliation you cannot force. Reconciliation has to come from both sides, and just because young Germans want it doesn't necessarily make it so. It has to come naturally by itself. Maybe it's possible for my children or their children, but it is not possible for me. I went with the film crew to Bergen-Belsen. They are building an enormous new museum to be finished by the end of the year. 
but they have hardly any visitors. What good are these museums in the middle of a country which is only accessible by car, not by train, and who will come and learn of the past? So I am not one of those people who is absolutely happy with what is going on in Germany. I was eight years old when Hitler came to power. I could not understand why we were acceptable, why the children on the streets threw stones at us, why we had to go to a private Jewish schools, school. And our parents would say, be patient, it'll change. It won't always remain like this. We were warned, on the other hand, to be quiet on the streetcar, not to sit down, to stand in the back of the streetcar, not to laugh, not to speak. We, in turn, asked what had we done to be punished in this way. The teachers at school did not answer our questions. Those of us fortunate enough to go to Palestine or the USA did not understand why they had to leave. And to us, it was a rather confusing circumstance. I lived in Germany as a foreign national. My parents were Polish until 1941. Poland lost the war in 1939 when the German army invaded Poland. My father was arrested the next day or even the same day. He was sent to Sachsenhausen and he was murdered after two years in Dachau. There is a grave for him in the Jewish cemetery in the city of Hamburg. But of course the ashes which the Gestapo delivered in a cigar box tied with a rubber band could be anyone's ashes, not necessarily my father's. I've only been once to that cemetery. It is difficult to go there, not knowing who is buried there. I have been back to Germany a number of times. I have been back to Poland four times and probably will go again in May. It is not an easy trip. I was asked at an interview two weeks ago how I feel being in Germany. And my answer was, it's walking around in a pair of shoes that are two sizes too small. And that's how I feel. I come home with a stomach ache, and yet I go, hoping that maybe one person in a school or university will learn something. In 1941, my mother, my sister, and I, after having moved from apartment to rooms to furnished rooms, to Jewish houses, as they were called, were deported to the ghetto of Lodz in central Poland. The ghetto at its height had 160,000 people in an area of roughly three square kilometers. We lived eight or 10 people to an average room. Food was rationed at irregular intervals. Bread was scarce, and we hungered. The cemetery at the edge of the ghetto has 70,000 unmarked graves, among them my mother's. My mother died in 1942 of hunger in the ghetto. My sister and I buried her. I worked in the ghetto in various offices and factories. Work was not mandatory but it gave you an additional soup at lunchtime, mainly water, a few turnips, and for that reason, most people worked. The German government has now decided, in fact, last week, to compensate us for ghetto work. It only took almost 65 years to get paid for ghetto work. What they'll pay, we don't know yet, but it's another bureaucracy which probably will lead to very little or to nothing. It won't make up for the pain, the suffering, and the hunger. 
My sister was deported from the ghetto with 20,000 other children in the curfew of 9th September 1941. We did not know for what purpose. We were told to another camp, a work camp, and we only found out in 1948 that all these transports were sent to Kulmhof or Helmo, an hour distant from the ghetto, and these people were gassed in portable vans and buried in mass graves. I have been back once, but we do not know exactly how many people are buried there. One is assuming close to 100,000, and we don't know any names. The ghetto continued. The ghetto was a self-administered entity. The Germans were in charge outside the ghetto, and the ghetto had a Jewish elder who followed German orders. You could not strike, you could not demonstrate, you could not say anything against the Jewish government inside the ghetto because it meant prison or deportation. In charge of the ghetto was Chaim Rumkowski. His reputation before the war as head of the Jewish orphanage was not a good one. His reputation in the ghetto, with very few exceptions, was a very bad one. You can only speculate now what would have happened if he had survived. Would we have killed him, or would we have let him live? It's a question to which there is no answer. The German historians argue that the office of the Jewish elders was a very difficult one. They had to follow German orders. They could not disobey unless they took their own lives which happened in the ghetto of Warsaw and Pukovno. The elder of the Jews of the large ghetto asked me once, if I survive the war, will you ask your uncles in Palestine to help me? And being very young and very afraid, I said yes. But in all honesty, I would not have. I personally considered him a collaborator even though the orders were German. And the historians in Germany argue now that they were not collaborators, that they had no choice. I, for one, disagree. They were chosen arbitrarily, without consideration of their background, of their education, of their position before the war. The one we had in the lodge ghetto could barely read or write. He had finished the third or fourth grade. The only language he spoke halfway was Yiddish. He neither spoke German nor Polish. Had the Germans not invaded Poland and not occupied Poland and not established the ghettos and not chosen the Jewish elders this would have never come to discussion. And then my answer in Germany, which is not very well accepted. I lived in the ghetto more than three years. The ghetto was liquidated in fall of 1944. No reason was given. The liquidation took place street by street. We were put into cattle cars and we did not know where we were going. Nobody really wanted to know to leave the ghetto. It is better to know the evil than to go to a place where you don't know it. The people were dying in the streets. We knew that hunger and typhus had taken over. What we did not know was that the Russians were across the river a few miles away. And the moment the ghetto was liquidated, the Russians occupied the entire city. 
800 young people had managed to hide and they were liberated by the Russians. Our train stopped at a place called Auschwitz. No one had ever heard of this place. This was in 1944, when a great many people from Hungary were sent to Poland, to Auschwitz. We had never heard of the place. It took less than a day to have the heads shorn, to lose all hair, to get rid of all clothing, all documents, anything personal, jewelry, whatever, and to go into a room and know that either there will be gas or there will be water. On our day, there was a little bit of water. And that night, we heard about chimneys, we heard about gas chambers, we heard about a crematorium, but we really did not know what it meant. We did not work in Auschwitz. We did not have any wooden cots. We were lying on the floors. The wooden cots were for the early arrivals, not for the late ones. And we were counted and recounted daily for several hours. It was fall, it could be very cold, it could be very hot. We had one rag of clothing, either an apron, a dress, a slip or whatever. No shoes, no stockings, no underwear. You looked at your friends with their shorn head and you did not recognize them. We received a black liquid in the morning, a slice of bread, and if you were lucky enough, a soup at night. But we had no containers for the soup. One of the women who had come with us from Poland was fortunate enough to get a pair of wooden clogs in addition to her dress. We used her wooden shoes at night to get soup into the shoes. And after one of us had eaten the soup, we passed the shoe on to the next one. But we guarded them very carefully. After several weeks in Auschwitz, we were put into cattle cars. And after three or four days, we arrived in the outer harbor of the city in Ham of Hamburg. We were used for forced labor to clean up bomb damage and uh, count and stack bricks, glass, metal, whatever needed to be done, we had to do. We built temporary housing for the Germans out of concrete blocks. We got very little to eat. And if you couldn't keep up to speed, you were shot. It was so-called one of the better camps. Last year, they opened an extension of the camp and the outside work camps that they had. It was called Neuengamme. But again, it is not accept, uh, accessible to the population. It is very far out in the countryside, and unless you have a car, you can't go there. The people housed there were mainly French prisoners, and at the end there were some women there, but most of them were male, French, and they had to work in quarries, they had to pave streets, tear up the stones and put them back again. The French still go back once every few years to Neuengamme with the French delegation. And uh, it is a, uh, a place of horror in France. It's very well known. From this place, we were transported again in open trucks and for a minute, I thought of jumping off the track, but I didn't. We came to a place that was called Bergen-Belsen, and at the entrance were two huge mountains of shoes, or probably about 10 feet tall. They were shoes of all colors, of all sizes, but no legs and no feet. And we couldn't understand why the shoes. We were put into barracks 
no cots, no blankets, no straw. And we found out after three or four days that Baden Belsen had epidemic proportions of typhus. People were dying on the camp streets. The bodies were lying unburied. There were huge pits with unburied bodies and that gold teeth had been removed. Their clothing had been removed. The bodies were turning green, but nobody was wearing them. On April 15, 1945, the British Army was moving north to the Elbe River, and quite by accident, they came upon this camp. They had no medical equipment, they had no food, they had nothing. They only saw what was happening, and the horror was unbelievable. In due time, we got some food, we got some medical help. They found over 10,000 unburied bodies and another 10,000 people died, which could not be saved after the war. I remember the first evening. I was translating for the British on the first day. We went to the mail camp and we saw a man who was practically dead, starving, cutting away at a corpse for the meat. The English couldn't get over this. The colonel for whom I translated asked me what I wanted. I said cigarettes and some biscuits, which I shared with a friend. They found a storeroom with um, large cans, two pound cans of pork and of fat. They handed out these cans on the first evening. How we opened them, I can't tell you. We might have taken a stone. And most of us, foolishly enough, ate the entire contents. And of course, we got very, very sick and some of us did not survive on the first day of liberation. How did we feel being liberated? For a minute, there was hope. And then came the realization that there were no fathers, no mothers, no sisters, no brothers. Whom will we find, if anyone? And most of them, most of us did not find anyone. I worked for the British for several months as a translator and interpreter. We interrogated the German SS. And during one of our conversations, I mentioned that I had memorized the names of some SS in a former camp. Nobody believed me, but after several weeks, they said, let's go and pick them up. We took several trucks and we went from house to house, picking them up, except for two. There were 40 of them. They all said the same thing. We never did anything bad. We only beat or shot you when you deserved it. I had no answers, none. After three days, when we had collected all of them, I asked to go past the prison doors, and I walked past them, I did not answer, I did not speak to them, but I saw them behind bars. I was asked to a hearing, preliminary hearing. I don't remember the questions or the answers. I only know that I spoke English. In days following this hearing, I received little notes under my door. We will find you and we will kill you. It was assumed that the families of these SS had written the notes. A few days later, I was driven together with two other women across the Dutch border, the Belgian border, into France, put on the, tra on the train in the city of Lille, and arrived in Paris early in the morning with limited French, but I could manage the equivalent of about two or three dollars, I found 
a youth hostel on the Rue de Rosier, and I hounded the American and the British Embassy day after day. I got papers for the United States in February and for Israel or Palestine at the same time. I picked the United States because a family in Palestine had my life marked out and for that I was too old. I was 20 years old and I did not want to be told what to do. I came to New York with three dollars. I had an old classmate in New York. I started working in a glove factory sewing gloves and a year later I met my husband. I went back to school at night. I learned to type, I learned shorthand, and then I went to Queen's College. And it took me as long to get an education until my sons graduated from college. I graduated at the same time. Going back is painful because the question arises, have we learned from the past? What have we learned from the past? How is it possible the genocide existed in Yugoslavia, in Africa, and the world stands by and doesn't do anything. So in my small and humble opinion, we have learned very little. It will probably be up to you and my sons and their children to change the world, if it's at all possible. If you have any questions, I will try and reply. Don't be shy. Yes. It was neither. I wrote the book because a friend in Berkeley who was 90 years old wanted to know about the past. And when she died, I found little notes and I put those together into a book. It didn't make, it didn't change me. It didn't change my opinions. It was not a cure for the past. And I will readily admit that all of us who survived are damaged to varying degrees, some more, some less. I have friends who will not leave their house, who will not cross the street unless you hold their hands who don't open curtains, so there are many sad, sad stories. I met him at a dinner party at a friend's house who knew his parents and who knew me and my parents. The name was rather unusual and I asked him for the first name of his parents. And after a few months he asked me whether I would tell him what happened to them. Because he was four years in the American army looking for his parents. I told them, and I told them once, and the subject was never discussed at home, neither with him nor with my sons, until they were 18 years old. They know, but it's not a topic of discussion. Yes. Oh, I'm going to repeat the question for people whose hearing isn't as terrific as yours. Uh, the question was, 
When was the first time you remember uh, talking about the past um, or your experiences? Probably around 1990, 1992. I did not go back to Europe for 50 years, to Germany specifically, or to Poland, and we didn't talk about it. And when I published my first book, the question my friends asked was, why didn't you ever tell us about the past? And my answer, why didn't you ever ask? I have a question. How old are your grandchildren? I don't have any. You don't have any grandchildren? No. Okay. Uh, not yet, and not I don't yet. think I will. <laughs> He's just writing. One of Lucille's sons is a very prominent economist. He teaches at Berkeley, and I've heard people, not Lucille, but other people who know say um, that at some point he might very well win a Nobel Prize no, in economics. No, I hope not. You hope not? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. I think the most honest answer would be friends. When I talked to my friend about touching the wire at Auschwitz, she said, wait a little bit. When we were in the other camps in Neuengamme, she said, be careful. At the end of the war, she lost her lung, one lung. She was very, very sick. She eventually went 1948 to Palestine and whenever I go to Israel, I do see her. She is blind now. She is one year younger than I am. But there were a couple of people, like this one friend, who brought me water when I was sick, who, who cared, and that's all they could do. They couldn't do anymore. But will to live, there was none. It didn't matter anymore. I was brought up Orthodox, Jewish Orthodox. There's nothing left. My question is, where was my God when a million children were murdered? And there is no answer to that question. I've asked it many times. Many people have tried to cope with that question. There is no answer. Yes, Kristen. Your answer to that question is that, that there is no answer, and you said two or three times in your talk about having questions that there were no answers. And I'm curious if there's any answer that would satisfy any of your questions, or is it sort of a rhetorical, not that no one has an answer, but there is no answer? Well, I've I've tried a few priests, I've tried a bishop, I've tried a couple of rabbis, no answers. Is there anything that they could say to you that, you, that would satisfy you, or do you? Well, in Jerusalem somebody told me it was God's will, and yours is not to question, which didn't satisfy me. Elie Wiesel has said, when they hung a man in Auschwitz, there hangs God. And in a sense, there is truth to it. I was wondering about what you remember about information from coming into the ghetto from outside, like news about the war or any kind of news at the house, how that affected your morale, I guess? The large ghetto had no underground canals. The sewage was running around, uh, along the streets. So you couldn't get out of the ghetto underground. And if you tried through the barbed wire, it was never successful. So news into the ghetto did not come in four years. And news did not go out. 
There was one radio and a friend of mine was able to occasionally repair it, but all he got was the BBC and the state of the war, which is not what interested us. We wanted to hear that people knew about us or that they were trying to help. Nothing. Nothing. The Lodz ghetto was the longest ghetto in existence in Poland, and no news go coming in or going out. You didn't dare go near a barbed wire. It was impossible. And there was nothing underground. For instance, Warsaw had underground sewers. Mm -hmm. We did not have any. We had no running water, we had no sewers, we had no toilets, we had no bathtubs, we had no showers, nothing. Did you have another question? Abby? Well, my hope lies with the young people. They are the ones who might make the difference, who might vote for a different government, who might end the war in Iraq, who might be people to be counted on. Not we. They are the ones who are important to me. I would like you to know that the students are out on the quad in protest of the war. Good. Uh, they're sleeping out there. Good. They're having teach-ins. I invite all of you to go over. Um, on Thursday in my section, we will be talking about how it might be possible to stop the war. We have that charge from Lucille, but I'm sure there are lots of other people who are. My kids did not approve of the Vietnam War in the 70s. And uh, they protested, and they did not want to go and fight. And it was very difficult to get out of the draft. But we said, whatever they decide, we will support them, and we did. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry that I came in late. resistance to oppression, resistance, what, how would you communicate the, the, the level of resistance that citizens uh, should consider to evil of the kind that you live in? The only resistance that I can recall when I was 17 years old was a resistance in the ghetto. Poetry, uh, writings, pictures, paintings, songs, and in several factories, we marched around yelling, no work, no bread, no work. But it only got us a prison term and a severe beating and eventual deportation. Because the elder of the Jews in the ghetto did not tolerate any kind of demonstration. So I know that there was some resistance, very little resistance in Germany. There was more resistance in Poland, and more Jews were hidden in Poland than in any other place. Maybe for money, maybe for religious reasons, and maybe because they were decent people. But that's the one thing that I have to leave them, in spite of their anti-Semitism today. Kimberly, do you have a question? Uh, just in regards to Camp Peace, that's over at my students, and on Thursday from 10 to 5, they're doing a peaceful protest. Do you have something to check out if you want to be a part of that? It's called Camp Peace. Did you have a question? No, you're just, OK. Barbara. Lucille, I know you've written more books that we have available to us because at least one of your books is originally in German and has yet to be uh, available. To no, us. it's originally in English, but it only was published in translation. <laughs> I, I, I know you've written about women's experience 
right. and more. And I, I'm wondering if you could share a tiny bit of that, your perspective on it. I knew a couple who lived around the corner from where I live. They had come to Poland in an earlier deportation in 1938 from Berlin. He was a Polish national. He was a Jew. He was educated as a lawyer in Poland and in Berlin. She was not Jewish. They had no children. They came into the ghetto and they even had brought some of their furniture into their little room. They did not have to share their room with other people, which was highly unusual. He was a very broken and a very sick man. He was the chief justice in the ghetto Jew system. On one ruling before I came to the ghetto, Rumkowski, the eldest of the Jews, publicly disagreed with his ruling. And Judge Neumark replied, are you, the, you a judge or am I a judge? My ruling stands, I will not change it. He lost his job and nobody in the ghetto dared give him any kind of employment. The factory making furniture had a very decent boss. And once a day, Mrs. Neumark would go with a canteen and get two portions of soup because he was ill and ailing and there was very little to eat. She showed me pictures of pre-war Berlin and she must have been a lady who weighed probably 180 pounds. She was now slim and thin and very blonde. He did die in the ghetto. A great many people turned out for his funeral, which was lame and very simple, but he was very much respected. I met her on the street, and she had been in the ghettos over three years, and she said to me, if you hear rumors, don't hold them against me. And I didn't know what to make of it. The rumor that spread after a few weeks was that she went to the Gestapo and she told them that she was not Jewish, she was German. Her husband had died. Her brother was a member of the Luftwaffe and she was entitled to leave the ghetto for Berlin. And she managed by whatever means possible. It wasn't easy, but she managed. And she did die in Berlin, but she was the most decent human being that I can recall. Yes. The question is that, um, the, what's your name? Jeremiah. Jeremiah is recalling what you said about your, your trip to Germany and your seeing all of the memorials and your feeling that the memorials don't really do much except exist. And he wants to know whether you see anything in the future or you have any hope in the future that things will change that there will be this kind of deep understanding and connection? I don't know. I can't predict the future. I can only hope. I wish there would be help for the many people living here and in other countries who, do, who survived the war, don't have enough money for rent or for food. That is one type of help I could understand. And it's been over 60 years, and it's not forthcoming. They are obviously waiting for the rest of us to die. Lucille, I just wanted to ask you, uh, and possibly some of my students and Myrna students might have the same question. 
Jewishness, being Jewish. I don't know if you can answer it. I don't know if any of us can answer it. But what is, what is a Jew today after in the experience? I mean, I'm not talking about God, but, but a Jewish person. How does it feel to be a Jewish person? I am a Jewish person myself, but I'm curious. What is a Jewish person? It's a religion that you inherit from your parents, whether it's a Catholic or Protestant or Jewish. It has nothing to do with my nationality now or then. They're two entirely different things. And what it means to be Jewish or Catholic is very different for each individual. For me, it is something I was brought up with. That I'm non-observant now is my choice. My older son is more or less observant. Uh, observant. My younger son is not. It's very hard to define. It's like any other religion. It depends what you took along from home. How much... I mean, I went 12 years to a Jewish school. I read and write Hebrew. I read and write Yiddish. I speak it. I was brought up Orthodox with all the trimmings. My grandmother wore a wig, not her own hair. And for me, it has no meaning. It's not necessary. Just be a decent human being is all I ask for. Okay, we have a question. Yes, I do. I once went out at night in 1941, before my father was murdered, to talk to a man who had been released from Dachau, which happened very rarely. He lived at the other end of town. My mother and I went out at night. It was not permitted for Jews to go out at night. We wore a yellow star. The streets were dark because of, uh, of the war and uh, English airplanes flying over the area. And on the way out of the house, we, saw, we heard boots and we saw two flashlights in the back of us. My mother ran to the right, I ran to the left. I fell and I ended up in the gutter and I didn't move. The boots stepped over my hand and disappeared in the distance as did the flashlights. I had broken my ankle, but the boots kept coming back in a dream. I would dream about the boots, I would, wake, I would scream, my husband would wake me and that was the end. But this is the one nightmare when I'm under stress that will come back. I was a very timid child. I would have never gone anywhere by myself. If my parents went out at night to a concert and there was a maid in the house, I wouldn't go to sleep until I heard him come home. Why, I cannot tell you. But I had a cousin who lived not far from us who went to England. The, the children that went to England are now 80 years old. They are traumatized, just like the rest of us. They were not given proper schooling. Their lives were saved. They were used as maids, as uh, laborers. A college education was practically out of question until the end of the war. And when the war ended, they looked for their parents and they never found them. So I don't know which would have been better. I cannot judge it. Yes. This is a very interesting question. The question is, 
how, uh, what was your reaction to coming to New York, but also what was people's reaction to you when you uh, came? Well, coming to New York, there were no social workers, there were no psychologists, psychiatrists, which you have now for the veterans, for instance. In fact, we coming from a DP camp or from a concentration camp, we are considered unacceptable. We had survived by some irregular or devious means. When I married my husband, his family who had gone to New York in the mid thirties did not approve for two reasons. They didn't want a Polish Jew in the family and they didn't want somebody out of the concentration camps. The end result was that we ended up in California and I've never been in contact with them. We'll perhaps talk about it in section, but the reaction to people who did survive was... We were dirty, we were unacceptable. We, we must have done something to be here. Right. Yes? Do you have any sense of guilt being someone who survived? But yes, my sister, I promised my mother I would take care of my sister, and I couldn't. In January 1944, my name was on a transport list out of the ghetto. The transport never arrived any place. You can't trace it. But I had some friends who took my name off the list. My question is, did somebody else go in my place or not? And that bothers me. Yes. The last day before Oh, when she left Auschwitz, or when she... The last step, I guess, concentration camp or Auschwitz. Okay, um, the question was, what was your reaction when you left um, Auschwitz? I did not know where I was going, whether it would be better or it would be worse. Um, there was no reaction to all, because you had no control over what you were of what you could do or could not do. You were told to go into a cattle car, so you walked into the cattle car. That was all. Okay, one last question. You said you waited until your sons were around 18 or so before you told them about your story. How did they respond? They didn't respond. They listened. They cried. My older son, I don't think, has ever been to the Holocaust Museum or to Dachau or to Baden-Benson. My younger son has been, but he won't talk about it. So it is a subject that's very difficult to discuss. Okay, I would like to thank Lucille very much. Thank you. find a way for her to sit down and do this, but she has said that if you would like, she'll sign your book for you.